Chaos Merchants, the means, motives, and opportunity of those behind the murders of Tupac Amaro Shakur, June 16, 1971 to September 13, 1996, Christopher George Latore Wallace, May 21, 1972 to March 9, 1997, and the attempted murders of Marion Hugh Knight Jr., May 19, 1965 to question mark by Michael Douglas Carlin and former LAPD detective Russell Poole. Chaos Merchants, copyright 2015, Michael Douglas Carlin and Russell Poole, all rights reserved. This audio narrated with permission. Former LAPD detective Russell Poole's death, August 19, 2015. Russell was an American hero. He knew the risks of what he was doing. We talked about it. He and I made a pact that if one of us was killed, the other would get the information out there where it could be used to bring the killers to justice. He died for something he believed in. He died because the Tupac and Biggie cases have always stuck in his craw and he wanted to solve them. He did solve them. He first tried to meet with the LAPD and they burned him. He thought the sheriffs provided an alternative that would serve justice. He hiked six miles a day and was in better health than I had ever seen him in. His spirits were high as he felt finally there would be someone that would bring this case to closure. I spoke with Russell Poole at 9 a.m. this morning. He was stuck in traffic in Diamond Bar on the 60, and he was on the way to meet with L.A. County Sheriffs in Monterey Park. I had talked to him yesterday about canceling the meeting, but out of respect for Jim McDonald, he felt he should go through with it. He was on his way to talk about the murder of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls with summary pages that were footnoted about the case. Russell told me he was going to call me the minute he got out of the meeting and let me know what was said. I waited and waited, but got no word from him. I sent a few inquiring text messages and got no response. About 5.30 p.m., I got a text message from one of my confidential informants telling me that Russell Poole was dead. I immediately looked it up on Google, and sure enough, the news reports were already in that Russell had died. It is strange that it hit the media before his family was notified. I was the one that called his aunt, and she broke down in tears from the news. What is also strange is that Bomb First had an interview from Reggie Wright Jr., who already had the news and he said he was glad Russell was dead. He also talked about our summary pages of information like he had those pages in front of him. He knew exactly what Russell was there to discuss. I know because Russell and I spent hours on the telephone discussing this meeting and preparing for it. How did Reggie Wright Jr. know about what homicide investigators were discussing with Russell minutes after the meeting and Russell dying? This ties directly to Suge Knight's current legal troubles, his shooting at the One Oak nightclub, and the attempt on Suge's life on the night of September 7, 1996, when Tupac was shot and later died as a result of the wounds he received that night. My opinion is that Russell was murdered because we have uncovered the truth about the murder of Tupac Shakur. It is reminiscent of the attempted murder of Michael Harry O'Harris while he was in prison and given a 7-up by one of the central characters in this story. It also makes me wonder if Tupac wasn't given something in those final hours. He seemed to be on the mend and took a turn for the worse and then his body was rushed off to be cremated. The truth is that an off-duty sheriff was videotaped letting the two shooters into the One Oak nightclub to kill Suge Knight. They picked the nightclub because the sheriffs would respond to the crime scene. Standard protocol was not observed, and they turned out the nightclub without getting witness statements. The crime scene was purposely bungled by sheriffs so that no prosecution could ever be made. The same off-duty sheriff was caught on videotape dropping the shooters off at LAX. He was brought in for questioning and fired. The investigation led to a payment of $50,000 to the shooters by someone directly tied to this story who was questioned but no charges have ever been filed. Then Suge is lured down to the Straight Outta Compton set where he will again be in L.A. County Sheriff's jurisdiction. Again, the crime scene is bungled 
and key witnesses are allowed to leave without giving statements or getting their contact information. The same investigator handled both crime scenes, which is a huge conflict of interest. Then David Kenner is appointed as Suge's attorney. Suge claims that David Kenner stole $80 million from him. Kenner tries to make deals with the prosecution to sell Suge Knight down the river. On March 2nd, there is a hearing to transfer the case to downtown. Suge Knight rises and fires David Kenner. Ignoring Suge, there is discussion after David Kenner is fired and they try to reach a deal for Suge Knight. There is a closed door meeting after Kenner is fired with Kenner and those transcripts have been withheld and then they were doctored before being released. On March 17th, the sheriff investigator that handled both cases, the one embroiled in the conflict of interest, visits the judge and gets him to sign a protective order that would not allow Suge Knight to have any other contact, incoming or outgoing, with anyone other than David Kenner. That protective order is signed 15 days after David Kenner was fired as Suge Knight's attorney. The sheriff's investigator called Russell Poole yesterday to ask about what they would discuss. Russell told the investigator that he knew that an off-duty sheriff had participated in the attempted murder on Suge Knight. He told them that they had a dog case on their hands and that they could save themselves from ultimate embarrassment when it became public that an off-duty sheriff participated in the attempt on Suge Knight. The investigator urged Poole to bring all of his case files on a disc to provide to investigators. He confirmed that, indeed, an off-duty sheriff had participated and asked Russell how he came to possess this information. Russell said he did not disclose the source of this information. So now, Suge Knight's life is in danger. Why? Well, the Compton Police Department was corrupt and they were not disbanded. Instead, they were absorbed into the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. The Compton Police were involved in the murder of Tupac Shakur and the cover-up. Reggie Wright Sr. is on the full MGM surveillance tape watching Orlando Anderson be interrogated. Look at the end of the tape. Who is it that shakes Orlando Anderson's hand and takes him away at the end of the tape? Is it the same man who knows about Russell's visit? And the intimate details of their conversation? The footnotes from page 2 and 3 are a link to Reggie Wright, Russell Poole Dead, Suge Knight is a Rat exclusive from bombfirst.com. It's a video. And the second footnote reads, Information received from Thaddeus Culpepper, Suge Knight's attorney. There are still remnants of the corruption inside of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. They have access to the jail system. I believe that Suge Knight is in danger now and that they have been attempting to kill him ever since September 7th, 1996 because of the hundreds of millions of dollars Death Row Records was worth at the time. If he is not removed from the sheriff control, there is a high probability he will not survive. I like Sheriff Jim McDonnell and I supported him in his sheriff's campaign. I met with him last year in March and wrote an article about him. You can see it on the American News Service website. It is my opinion that Jim has no idea about the corruption that still exists within the Sheriff's Department. There are over 18,000 employees, and he has yet to clean house. Now is the time, Sheriff, for you to act swiftly to solve the Tupac and Biggie murders and to do the right thing here in the memory of Russell Poole. Russell's father was an L.A. County Sheriff for decades, He was well-respected and deserves for you to treat his son right. To Jim McDonald, on a personal note, today I called you on your cell phone. I sent you numerous text messages, and you have yet to respond to me. Please do the right thing for Russell Poole. It was you that set up this meeting. We discussed it on July 22nd. There needs to be a full investigation into this death with a coroner looking into all exotic toxins that could trigger a heart attack. Then again... We know there are substances that are untraceable. Please do the right thing here. Pages 5 to 12 are what Russell gave to the sheriff investigators. I apologize for the rough form that the rest of this document is in, but it was only a draft and not scheduled to be released until September 13th. I am releasing it now 
so that the truth has a chance of getting out there. Russell's estate and I retain the copyright, but I intend for all of you to know that we encourage you to share it with true Tupac and Biggie fans. Footnote 3 is a link to a website. The links are also available in the document or in the description below. On July 14, 2015, Michael Carlin receives the following email from Thaddeus Culpepper to Michael Douglas Carlin. Hello, I am one of Suge Knight's criminal defense attorneys. I got your letter from my co-counsel, Tom Messero. Read your letter with great interest. Please contact me. 626-XXX-XXXX. That is J. Culpepper. July 14, 2015, I called Thad at 9.25 p.m. Tom and I read your letter with great interest. We just got off of the telephone with Suge Knight. Tom read your letter and your Tupac murder facts to Suge in his jail cell. Suge Knight said, Who the fuck are these guys and how do they know all of this? I never thought any of this information would become public. I was silent. Thad broke that silence by saying, Suge Knight verified that all of this is true. Russell Poole also called Thaddeus and verified that Suge Knight stated it was all true. Information on Tupac's murder. On March 6, 2014, Russell Poole arranged for Michael Carlin to meet with respected Fox 11 journalist Chris Blatchford to discuss a confession letter to the murder of rapper Tupac Shakur that Blatchford received in 1998 from one of the alleged shooters. At that meeting, Blatchford discussed his interactions with two of the shooters, one of which was supposed to take out Suge Knight. A copy of the letter was given to Carlin. Blatchford forwarded to Russell Poole a statement about the letter and the additional information he had received from the shooters and confidential informant. This clue, along with all of the corroborating evidence, gives us our best chance to solve this murder and bring the killers to justice. Victims, Marion Suge Knight. The hit was supposed to go down at the club. The target of the hit at the club was Suge Knight. Malcolm said he was the shooter that was supposed to take out Suge Knight. A bounty was put on Tupac and Knight. Caffey has determined that there are three separate hit contracts on Suge Knight's life. Caffey also indicated that the Rolling 60s and Bounty Hunter Kill Squad from the Compton area have indicated that Suge will be taken out before Christmas. It was also related by Caffey that the reality of Suge being killed in Tarzana was extremely high due to the fact that Suge is an easy target at Death Row Records. Tupac Shakur Little Half Dead was supposed to kill Tupac. Little Half Dead was the one that took Tupac out. A bounty was put on Tupac and Knight. Motive. Revenge. The shooter, Little Half Dead, that killed Shakur, had a revenge motive. Little Half Dead is Snoop Dogg's cousin. Death Row had begun recouping against Snoop's $5 million legal bill. That the victory had been financed entirely on Suge's dime, worked to legally justify the label's position in ceasing to pay Snoop while it collected against the debt, did not calm the label's only remaining marquee superstar. As a result, the sentiment between the two parties grew all the more sour as months passed. Knight had a falling out with Snoop Doggy Dog. There was tension between Tupac and Snoop's entourages. Three days before the shooting, Snoop had a severe falling out with both Suge and Tupac in New York. At one point, Snoop actually feared for his life on the flight. Little Half Dead and Tupac had dispute about songs that were taken. Little Half Dead was beaten down by Tupac's soldiers. Little Half Dead was upset with Tupac because Tupac stole one of his songs. Very deliberate in his aim. Um, had he been wildly shooting, he would have been able to shoot Mr. Knight as well as being a larger target. He definitely knew who he was shooting. There was no hesitation. The gun came out and it was pop, 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 pow. As soon as the arm came out, Brent Becker asked Yafeo Fulu, a.k.a. Gaddafi, why the shooter would want to do this. His answer was jealousy. He further stated that the shooter's arm was dark black. 
Money. The shooter that was hired to take out Suge Knight had the financial motive of a cashier's check for $100,000. Danny was paid $100,000 for the hit in the form of a cashier's check. Money, prestige, and power. The conspirators who ordered the hit had a financial motive of hundreds of millions of dollars. The shares of Death Row Records and Tupac's music, as well as being tired of Suge Knight's antics. Wright wanted rights to all Tupac's material. Means. Guns. There were shooters, spotters, and conspirators. Three guns were used, Tech 9 45, and a Glock. Frank Alexander says, All I saw was the arm and the gun, and right away I knew it was a Glock automatic. As for gun that was used, will be dropped off at the security booth at Fox 11. Please do not have stop or talk to one of my dropping off the gun. I talked to Malcolm on the telephone and we set up a meeting. He said he would bring one of the murder weapons and wanted to do an on-camera interview to protect himself. The letter also said that Malcolm would drop off one of the murder weapons at KTTV Studios. Tell ex-con how you want it delivered. I don't want to put it in a box because I don't want you thinking it's a bomb. When I returned to the station, security told me a young black man had tried to drop off a package for me at the guard shack. Company policy prohibited them from accepting it. According to Kevin Hackey, the gun used to kill Tupac Shakur was a Glock 40 that was confiscated by an off-duty Santa Monica police officer during a routine search at the House of Blues of Hussein Fatal, one of Tupac's outlaws, on July 4th. 1996, when he is detained attempting to enter the venue with his Glock 40. These are the footnotes from pages 6 and 7. They'll be posted below, as well as in the document. Interview of Gregory Johnson by LVMPD on March 20, 1997. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. Tupac Shakur's murder confession letter received by Chris Blatchford on June 5, 1998 and given to Michael Carlin by Chris Blatchford on March 6, 2014. Suge Knight, The Rise and Fall and Ruse of Death Row Records by Jake Brown. SLO Knox Police Log from his investigation of Can-Am Studios July 1, 1996. Producer Daryl Harper about tension between Tupac's entourage and Snoop Dogg's entourage. And it's a web link to YouTube. Snoop Lion remembers final interaction with Tupac, talks gun buyback program by Roman Cooper. Tupac Shakur's murder confession letter received by Chris Blatchford on June 5, 1998 and given to Michael Carlin by Chris Blatchford on March 6, 2014. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. Frank Alexander interview by Brent Becker on March 19, 1997. Yafeo Fulu, a.k.a. Qaddafi statement to LVMPD's Brent Becker, September 8, 1996. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. Frank Alexander interview with Brent Becker of LVMPD immediately after the shooting, September 7, 1996. Tupac Shakur's murder confession letter received by Chris Blatchford on June 5, 1998 and given to Michael Carlin by Chris Blatchford on March 6, 2014. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. Tupac Shakur's murder confession letter received by Chris Blatchford on June 5, 1998 and given to Michael Carlin by Chris Blatchford on March 6, 2014. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. In late July, Reggie Wright contacts Kevin Hackey and asks him to keep tabs on the weapon. The off-duty Santa Monica officer takes the gun back to the Santa Monica police station. The gun was then ballistics tested by the FBI and run to see if the weapon was stolen or had been used in any crimes. There were no ballistic matches at the time, so the FBI sends the weapon back to the Santa Monica police. Sometime in August of 1996, Santa Monica police contact Kevin Hackey and tell him the gun is cleared for pickup. Hackey, who was working undercover for the FBI and ATF, retrieves the gun and takes it to his handlers. They clear him to release the gun to Reggie Wright Jr. Hackey hands the gun to Reggie Wright Jr. Subsequently, the Glock 40 is used to kill rapper Tupac Shakur. White Cadillac the CI said the hit team trio had rented a pearl white Cadillac at the Stratosphere Hotel Las Vegas and later dumped it at a salvage yard in Baker, disassembled. Witness Hart stated that the white car was to their right and in front of them, so she was able to see the rear of the car. Hart feels that the white car had Nevada license plates, white with blue, and felt the car was possibly rental. 
Hart thinks the shooting came from the driver's side of the white car and that there was four occupants. Turner felt the Cadillac had Nevada rear license plates with possible numbers 647. Turner thought that the occupants of the white Cadillac may have been shooting from both sides of the car. Radios. While I was working at 662, I heard something over the next tells we were carrying, and what I heard was, got him. The voice was definitely one of our security that works directly for Mr. Knight. Maybe the police should have concentrated more on death row, the Nextel phone bills, and other things that could have helped them investigate it more in depth. I would definitely look more at death row than I would look at Mr. Anderson, and that is what I gathered when I was at New York, what I heard Pock tell Suge Knight, and what I heard on the radio that night after the shots were fired. Right before me and Mr. Wright got into the vehicle to go to the hospital, someone else came on the radio and said, Hey, don't say nothing over the radio. Mr. Wright and I were talking about what had happened, and I clearly heard someone say, Don't say nothing over the radio. But the person that said it was not homeboy security, nor was it one of our security guards. To me, he was a stranger, but the person that said it was Caucasian, definitely not African American. A radio is significant because it implies that there were spotters as well as shooters. This also makes this just like the Biggie Smalls murder. He, Noel Johnson, a.k.a. Big Spank, just spoke on him that you know. He got him. Opportunity. The opportunity was created on fight night in Las Vegas where every detail was being controlled by Reggie Wright Jr., the head of death row security. This was a coup d'etat at Death Row Records, orchestrated by insiders at the record label. They tried to kill Suge Knight that night, and they have been conspiring against him ever since. He, C.I., says it was Wright who, on the night of Tupac's murder, told the killers where Tupac would be, along with Suge. There were six different barricades that no matter what would have happened, no one would have made it out. Jurisdiction the conspiracy started at Death Row Records, located in Los Angeles County, California. The confession letter talks about a meeting at Balboa Park that is located in Los Angeles County, California. The actual shooting took place in Las Vegas, Nevada. Suspects Lil Half Dead, a.k.a. Donald Smith, is the cousin of rapper Snoop Doggy Dog. Little Half Dead was the one that took Tupac out. Malcolm Greenridge said he saw a dark-skinned arm with a black gun fire from the white Cadillac. Little Half Dead and Tupac had dispute about songs that were taken. Little Half Dead was beaten down by Tupac's soldiers. Little Half Dead was upset with Tupac because Tupac stole one of his songs. Very deliberate in his aim, um, had he been wildly shooting, he would have been able to shoot Mr. Knight as well as being a larger target. He definitely knew who he was shooting. There was no hesitation. The gun came out and it was... Pop, 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 pow, as soon as the arm came out. Brent Becker asked Yafeo Fulu, a.k.a. Qaddafi, why the shooter would want to do this. His answer was jealousy. He further stated that the shooter's arm was dark black. Frank Alexander says, All I saw was the arm and the gun, and right away, I knew it was a Glock automatic. Frank Alexander further stated that the shooter was a dark black male. Little Half Dead was represented by Suge Knight, and Death Row Records, and his contract was sold off to Priority Records. And he was sponsored mostly by S.H. Knight. What Knight did not know was that Little Half Dead found out that he was being sold to Priority. One. On Little Half Dead's album cover for Dead Serious, you could see the image of the slain Tupac Shakur at Can-Am Studios along with the slain Yak Fula. Snoop calls Little Half Dead his enforcer. Death Row had begun recouping against Snoop's $5 million legal bill that the victory had been financed entirely on Suge's dime, worked to legally justify the label's position in ceasing to pay Snoop while it collected against the debt, did not calm the label's only remaining marquee superstar. As a result, the sentiment between the two parties grew all the more sour as months passed. Knight had a falling out with Snoop Doggy Dog. There was tension between Tupac's and Snoop's entourages. Three days before the shooting, Snoop had a severe falling out with both Suge and Tupac in New York. At one point, Snoop actually feared for his life on the flight, as he was stripped of all of his bodyguards. In an interview with Snoop and Lil Half Dead with AllHipHop.com, we learn, Snoop, like Dr. Dre, I don't let N-words talk bad about Dr. Dre. I could talk bad about him, but y'all can't. 
little half dead. And the cold part about it is, I wouldn't let nobody talk bad about Dre just because he, Snoop, love him. Snoop. Better not. It don't matter. Laker fans, Raider fans, whoever your friends are, you ride with them to the fullest. And if someone disrespects your people, you feel disrespected. This is my homie Half Dead right here. An N-word can't say nothing foul about Snoop Dogg in front of him. In jail, on the street, no matter where he at. I don't give a fuck if we ain't cool. A person can't say nothing. White boy, a.k.a. Danny Patton. I shot that Tupac motherfucker. I was there, man. One name, and I heard the name. Uh, I don't know if it was Gangsta White or it was something along that line. I clearly heard someone say, don't say nothing over the radio. But the person that said it was not homeboy security, nor was it one of our security guards. To me, he was a stranger, but the person that said it was Caucasian, definitely not African American. The driver was bald with a little mustache and light skin, but not as light skinned as Gaddafi. He said the driver had the face of a bitch because he looked soft in the face. Danny's gun jammed. These are the footnotes. Chris Blatchford, Fox 11 interview of Frank Alexander and Kevin Hackey, and it's a web link. Chris Blatchford's statement of Russell Poole about the confession letter. Statement of Lauren Michelle Hart on 9-10-97 to Katz Martin. Statement of Shelaine LaShawn Turner on 9-9-97 to Katz Martin. YouTube video Tupac bodyguards speak out about murder, and it's a web link. Interview of Gregory Johnson by LVMPD on March 20, 1997. Chris Blatchford's statement of Russell Poole about the confession letter. Tupac Shakur's murder confession letter received by Chris Blatchford on June 5, 1998 and given to Michael Carlin by Chris Blatchford on March 6, 2014. Malcolm Greenridge interview with LVMPD, Brent Becker, September 8, 1996. Tupac Shakur's murder confession letter received by Chris Blatchford on June 5, 1998 and given to Michael Carlin by Chris Blatchford on March 6, 2014. Chris Blatchford's statement of Russell Poole about the confession letter. Frank Alexander interview by Brent Becker on March 19, 1997. Yafeo Fulu, a.k.a. Gaddafi statement to LVMPD's Brent Becker, September 8, 1996. Frank Alexander interview with Brent Becker of LVMPD immediately after the shooting, September 7, 1996. Tupac Shakur's murder confession letter received by Chris Blatchford on June 5, 1998 and given to Marco Michael Carlin by Chris Blatchford on March 6, 2014. Album cover for Little Half Dead's Dead Serious, and it's a link to an Amazon page. Suge Knight, The Rise and Fall of and Ruse of Death Row Records by Jake Brown. SLO Knox Police Log from his investigation of Can-Am Studios, July 1, 1996. Producer Daryl Harper about tension between Tupac's entourage and Snoop Dogg's entourage. And there's a link to a YouTube video. Snoop Lion remembers final interaction with Tupac talks gun buyback program by Roman Harper. Snoop and Lil Half Dead interview with All Hip Hop, and it's a link to the article. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. Interview of Gregory Johnson by LVMPD on March 20, 1997. YouTube video, Tupac Bodyguards Speak Out About Murder. It's a link. Yafeo Fulu, a.k.a. Gaddafi, statement to LVMPD, Brent Becker, September 8, 1996. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. Malcolm Patton. I can call you on a safe number and give you details of the clothing, cars, streets, and describe anything you need to know to prove that I was there the night Tupac tried to escape like a little peon bitch. The person Turner saw seated right front passenger was described as a male black, light brown skin, short hair, cut low, in his 20s, possible late 20s. Malcolm said he was the shooter that was supposed to take out Suge Knight. Malcolm shot twice. And missed this target. Conspirators. Reggie Wright Jr. He told me that Sharitha Knight and Reggie Wright were behind the murder. Mr. Rith Jr. gave info where Tupac was going to be. He says it was Wright who, on the night of Tupac's murder, told the killers where Tupac would be along with Suge. Michael Moore tells of hearing Gotham come over Reggie Wright's radio while he was standing next to him at Club 662. Reggie Wright was responsible for disarming all of the security on the night Tupac was shot. It was all Reggie's fault. It wasn't even something where you could debate it. Every decision came from Reggie's mouth. 
Reggie Wright Jr. is seen in the MGM surveillance video walking with a woman, possibly Sharitha Knight, and then shaking hands with Orlando Anderson and leading him away. See chapter on Reggie Wright Jr. below. Sharitha Knight. Even though Shugan Sharitha had become estranged, she did stand to inherit his shares if he was killed. She was on the paper. He told me that Sharitha Knight and Reggie Wright were behind the murder. See chapter on Sharitha Knight below. Possible co-conspirators. Kevin Gaines was on special assignment from two days before the Tupac murder until two weeks after. He was in Las Vegas on the night Tupac was killed. David Kenner. CI says David Kenner was at the gang summit in Balboa Park and that he is on the videotape when Reggie Wright Jr. contracted the hit. Reggie Wright Sr. Reggie Wright Sr. tells Michael Moore his son would run the company if something happened to Suge. Also, Reggie Wright Sr. is watching Orlando Anderson be interrogated by MGM security and the Las Vegas police immediately after the altercation with Suge Knight, Tupac Shakur, and their entourage. Reggie Wright Sr. participated in an investigation at the Compton PD. Members of ICG Gear Gang Ghost Town, Front Street, 52, a Tri Hoovers, and South Park. There was a gang summit in Balboa Park. The gangs in attendance included ICG, which is Long Beach Insane Crip Gang, Gear Gang, which is West Adams District of South Los Angeles, Ghost Town, which is Crips in Venice, Front Street equals Watts Crips, 52 equals 5 deuce at 52nd Street and South Broadway. A Tri Hoovers equals 8 Trey Hoovers, 83rd Hoovers, and South Park equals 51st and Avalon. CI says at first there was a get-together in Balboa Park in the San Fernando Valley for different gangs. This was disguised as a Blood Crips truce meeting, but it was really a feeler for Wright to see how much it would take to get Tupac hit. Wright wanted rights to all of Tupac's material. Those not in on the plan that night were sent to the 662 Club in Las Vegas. On these footnotes, a lot of these are repeats, except we have statement of Shelaine LaShawn Turner on 9997 to Katz Martin. We got YouTube video Tupac bodyguard speak out about murder with a link. Frank Alexander telephone conversation with Michael Moore on secret tapes. John Potash has posted the entire MGM surveillance video at this link. Frank Alexander's secret tape recordings of his telephone calls in the aftermath of Tupac Shakur's murder. Chris Blatchford's statement to Russell Poole about the confession letter. FBI files released on the Tupac murder investigation through FOIA request. Frank Alexander conversation with Michael Moore on his secretly recorded telephone conversations. John Potash has posted the entire MGM surveillance video. Tim Brennan affidavit to obtain search warrant. And the rest are repeats. So that concludes part one of 10 of Chaos Merchants. Subscribe to this channel to be notified when part two of 10 is released.